in a lot of different areas that just kind of confirms the message that God's put on all our hearts around purity and around that process of sanctification, you know, coming to know the Lord, but there's still this entire process that takes place before we can really uh, walk in accordance at times with his word. I grew up, some of you know, that I grew up with a very distorted view of marriage. Um, I was not a, a Christian in that I didn't have a real relationship with uh, Jesus Christ. I didn't really understand um, the love of God. I didn't understand God as a father. I didn't understand the Holy Spirit. Those things were not a part of uh, my upbringing. I knew the terminology, but I really didn't know how to bring it into my life and into practice. And so, you know, I grew up thinking that in marriage, you're supposed to have a plan B because um, I saw divorce happening not just with my own parents, but all of my aunts and uncles. It seemed to be like one string after another of divorce. So my, the message to me, because no one was telling me how to interpret that, was, well, you need a backup plan, right? Now imagine you're growing up and thinking that when I get married, I need a backup plan. If that's already in your head, you've already set yourself up to fail in marriage because you're going to look for the way out. There's a part of you that's going to um, expect that this is not going to work out somewhere along the way. So for me, marriage was not permanent. So imagine what my relationships looked like. You know, I would go with the flow. I would date people. I would look and not know what was happening, you know, when you talk about um, STDs or you talk about a soul tie or this remembrance in the body with every person that you've been with, there's like a, a residue or an imprint that happens on your body. We call them soul ties. Your body is, uh, when we talk about one flesh, as Randy was talking about, it's like being tethered in the spirit to other people who are also tethered to other people. Now, this is not just a body thing. This is a spirit thing. So you know how sometimes you can be with someone and then you go, man, that person, or maybe it's not us, maybe it's someone else you're talking to, and they're like, eh, it's really not working out. They have a lot of issues. Do you know what those issues are? There's a whole um, spiritual realm of oppression and demonic activity that influences the way we think and the way we act. And when you intertwine your body with someone else, it becomes like this open bridge between you and them and all of the impression. And so you get a lot of their stuff. You get influenced by their stuff. And then as you go out and bring that, you bring that stuff and all that weight with the next person that you're with. If those things don't ever get reconciled or cleansed or purified before God, then that's where we have all of the issues in marriage. And for some people, it may not be a sexual thing. It can be a generational thing. You have people in your family who have these strongholds, or maybe there's perversions. Maybe there's these uh, lies. Maybe there's a sorcery, divination, things like that, that you grew up under the influence of and didn't even know it. That's part of your bridge that was given to you or opened up to you through people who had relational authority over your life. And as long as those things exist, they have the freedom to wreak havoc in your life. Now for me, I had no idea that that's what all this weight was that I felt even growing up. I felt this distinct melancholy in my heart that I could not explain. You know, and it made me feel like I was unworthy and not worthy to be loved. Because I don't love myself. You know, and I think I, I, I see that a lot in a lot of our youth today. You know, they not only are they awkward and hormonal and not knowing what their body's doing as their body's trying to catch up and they're trying to make sense of attraction and how they feel, but the way they look. And the standard, again, like Brady and Samantha were talking about, there's this standard by society and the media that uh, not just the youth, but us, measure ourselves against. When we should be measuring ourselves against what God says. You know, uh, deep inside this insecurity that I was talking about, um, anytime I had a relationship, I found ways to sabotage it so it wouldn't work because I was afraid to trust people. 
part of it is I didn't trust myself. And then the other part of it is the people who surrounded my lives who perhaps should have been there to teach me and protect me, I didn't have that. So I figured nobody else can actually fill those shoes. So I began to do it for myself. Let me just cut this off before someone else can hurt me. So it's a lot of start and stop, start and stop. And um, I hit a point. What was it you called it, Randy? Was it your, your stop point your, when you're done? When you're just done with your sick of being sick. Sick of being sick. That was, okay. So that was me, my sick of being sick. Some of you know some of this. I was a single parent. I hit a point where I was like, no one's going to love me like this. I'm kind of like dirty, you know? I had, a, I had that in my head. You want to hear me say that out loud. I kept a brave face on the outside. I functioned. I went to church. But in the deepest parts of myself was this voice of the enemy constantly telling me, look what you did to yourself. Like, really? Who's really going to want that? So I settled. Settled for relationships that held no commitment because I thought that's all I could have. And then I got sick of being sick because my life was sick. That was sickness. I was broken. I was broken. I didn't like who I saw in the mirror. So how could someone else? So even if someone was genuine and trying to speak encouragement life to me, I rejected because I couldn't see it for myself. And I finally hit a point where I did. I got sick of being sick. And I said, God, I need you. I really need you to show me what love is. I don't, I clearly don't know what it is. I don't know how to receive it. And I don't know how to give it. But surely, if you're supposed to be a loving God, <laughs> then I suppose you have a lot to teach me. And that began a journey for me of five years of no dating. I dedicated my body and my time and my mind to getting into the Word of God. Because I figured, as I, I get this feeling, I've only heard portions of the Word. <laughs> and a lot of the portions that I heard, unfortunately, were taught in a manner that just created more condemnation over myself instead of uh, the full <laughs> embodiment of scripture and God's incredible love for you and me. And one of the things, like, does anyone here think that relationships are a little confusing sometimes? <laughs> Just me? Oh, yeah, we're all in the same boat. So before we can understand our relationships with each other, we need to understand God's relationship to us. In Genesis 1, we're talking about the first book of the Bible. We see here in Genesis 1, 26, 27. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Does anyone here feel like God is really beautiful and magnificent? Yes? Yeah? You feel that way? Then I s suggest to you that you should stop saying that you're not. Because whose image did he make you in? You know, I have people that tell me, because this is a, a, it was a deep inner work, a deep work of the inner person, an upheaval in the soul, <laughs> and a whole cleansing out by the power of his spirit to get to a place where I could stop pushing people away and start to believe that his spirit really was in me. And if his spirit drew me by his beauty, by his grace, by his love, and by his power, then the people who are being attracted to me, and I'm not talking about romantically, I'm just talking about friends even, and people, were beginning to see his spirit in me. And that was the first time I could actually begin to accept myself 
as something worthy and as something beautiful. Because I knew to say or speak anything contrary to that would be contrary to what he said here. He made us in his image. That alone, and, the, and his spirit, knowing that his word says that when we believe in Jesus, we, get, we make him Lord over our life, his spirit indwells us. And when his spirit indwells us, the fullness of God is in us. It's just when we don't take hold and understand that he's there, that we shush him and quiet him. And it's not because he's left you or abandoned you. It's because the world has told you for so long and you've bought in for so long. And you haven't quite looked at what he really says about you. When uh, those of you who are parents, how many parents do we have in the room? Parents, grandparents, okay, good. So when we create children, who do they belong to? They belong to God and they belong to us, right? I know some very possessive parents. They're like, you hurt my child. And, and then the head goes and the hand goes. <laughs> like, I can be really calm and really up when you do something to my kid and the voice goes really high. <laughs> Imagine how God feels when you're hurt. But if we can only capture a little moment of what that feels like in our humanity, Imagine the heart of God who created you and who created your children and this incredible grief or sadness that he feels when we're broken or someone's hurt us. See, the devil likes you to think that he doesn't care and that he's not there. But he created you. And so let me tell you here, um, when we get protective over our kids, the person who put that there was God, because he's the ultimate creator. So he not only took delight when he created you, he takes pride in his craftsmanship. I mean, he calls you beloved. He calls you his masterpiece. He says that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. The world may tell you something really different to that. And then you get this choice when you start to learn God's word. Are you going to believe what people have told you all your life? Or are you going to believe God who created you? Because we all have the will and the choice to do that. If we keep moving on here, it says in uh, Genesis 128. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it, reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along, along the ground. So we see here we're created with this purpose. You know, God created us to rule and reign over his creation. He may have created us last, but he put us in charge of all the things he took the light in and created before us. And yet he told us to take care of what he's created. And it says God bless them, which means God wants to bless you, not curse you. He wants to bless you because you belong to him. See, those of you who grew up feeling like you didn't belong anywhere, it's usually because you didn't know that you belonged to God. But you do. His word tells us over and over again. You know, we just see it in book one. Genesis, I created you, you're mine. Now, in verse 29 and 30, we see how God makes provision for us through creation. Like, he gives us his plants to eat. So all these things he created for us to tend and take care of, he made it so that we could live off of what he provides for us. It's in his nature to provide for us as well. And some of us don't look at God as our provider, so we strive to make different places of provision for us. And it, and it can also, it's amazing, in marriage, it's one of the number one causes of divorce, finance. Miscommunications about finance, mismanagement of finance, the stress or the lack of finance, 
creates all of these different things because we take our eyes off of who our provider is and how we can lean on him. I mean, and we've got that in scriptures in Matthew about the birds and the lilies in the field being clothed and how their food is provided for. What more you who are his children? What more you who he created and loves? So then this one, and I'm going to bring my husband up here in a second. We look in verse 31, and I love this because he said, now keep in mind, this is day six of creation. Many of us know on day seven he rested. So he creates everything, creates us, man and woman, on day six. And this is then God looked over all he had, and he saw that it was very good. When you say something's very good, wouldn't you say that you are feeling pleasure? <laughs> so don't mistake, see a lot of people think, and I thought this too, this aspect of purity meant rule and regulation. You can't do this, you can't do that, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, which inspires no one to follow. <laughs> and you burn out on your own strength trying to. But when you understand that God created, come just read the Song of Solomon, read the Song of Songs, <laughs> and you'll see that is a very intimate book about sexual intimacy as well between a husband and a wife. In the right context, it's also a great mirror of God's love for us when you read that back and forth, because this is one incredible love story, is what we have available between us and God, and the intimacy he desires in our heart and in our mind. But one of the things that helped me change my behavior, change my mind, and start to walk pure was first was God's love and believing that I belonged to him and that he truly loved me. No matter what I did, no matter what, where I was, that his grace was so readily available to me. In his kindness toward me and his compassion toward my life and my poor choices and how God never condemned me, though I condemned myself. And as he walked me through that, I started to realize, it's not that sex is bad. It's what happens when it's outside of a, the protected and loving context of marriage. Because you do tie yourself and your flesh and your emotions and your spirit to someone else's stuff that may not be with you lifelong to help you work through some of that stuff with God as well. And then they're off, they're off to the next one. So I started to say that God has a reason why this is, and it's to protect my heart. It's not to restrict me from having fun or to receive pleasure, but truly because he has a design where I can enjoy that deep level of intimacy with one person. So I wanna bring my husband up, because we're gonna talk just a little bit here about what it means to leave and cleave. You know, Mia is right. I mean, and so are Randy. Mm -hmm. So is Samantha. You know, God created sex. He did it. He created it for us. He created it for it to be within the context of marriage. And for me, for the longest time, especially as a young person, I always thought that sex is bad. You know, I always thought of it like, no, 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 that's, that's evil. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't go there, and, and you can't do it, you can't do this, you can't do that. And it became a, one of the things on the list of you can't do. But he created for it to be good, to be within the context of marriage. And there's a reason for that, as my wife has stated, is so that we can live lives that are healthy marriages and, and all these different things that sometimes when we don't, do it that way, we bring other things into our lives, into our marriages, into these different places that kind of distort or, or, or bring less meaning to what a good, healthy marriage looks like. You know, I wanted to be married since I was 18. Since I was 18 years old, I was seeking God, and I knew I wanted to get married. I thought I was married. I mean, I thought I was ready at 18. 
And uh, because, you know, I was serving God, everything was good. And I was just like, okay, Lord, you know, bring me my wife. <laughs> Proverbs 18, 22 says, the man who finds a wife finds a treasure and receives favor from the Lord. Who doesn't want that? <laughs> right? And so as a, as, a, as a young man, you know, I, I, I struggled with this because God was not bringing my wife. <laughs> At 18, 19, 20, I was going into my college years. And then finally got to the point where I, I said, you know what, God's taking too long. It's taking too long. I think I'm going to kind of do the, you know, take matters into my own hand. And, and pretty soon I, I found a girl that I was uh, attracted to. And, uh, you know, she came from a Christian family, but she wasn't really Christian, you know. She was kind of living in the world, doing whatever she wants to do. Uh, only thing she had, you know, going for it to her parents were Christian. But that was good enough for me. I was like, you know, that that's okay. You know, the no work itself out. I ended up making many mistakes. I got into this unequally yoked relationship because I wasn't patient enough. I, was, I wasn't trusting God and I wanted to take matters into my own hand. Well, this, this girl turned out to be crazy. <laughs> She had a lot of brokenness. Um, there was one time I think we went into a mall, and this should have been the red flag. We went to a mall, and some girl, and this guy coming into my face, and he's like this much taller than me, big guy, probably could bench press a Volkswagen, you know. And he's breathing. I remember, I still remember his his breath. It wasn't very good breath, but it's right in my face, and he's all like. Who do you think you are? You know, you know, because I was with the with with my girlfriend at the time, and he's breathing down my neck. You know, we're gonna get you. I gotta. And he said the, these words. I gotta quit in my car, which means it's slang for I have a gun in my car. And you know, your girlfriend did this this hit hit my girlfriend with a with with a crowbar or something. <laughs> And I'm kind of looking there. I mean, this is only like two weeks into the relationship. I'm looking. There's a security guard right next to us in the mall. And he's just kind of looking at us. He was scared, too. He didn't want to get up. And I'm kind of going like, aren't you the security guard? Aren't you supposed to be doing something? He wasn't doing anything. And then finally, we, we ran out. And, and I asked her, I said, so what happened? She goes, well, that girl, you know, I got in a fight with her, and, and I, you know, we went to court, and, and um, I ended up hitting her with a crowbar. And I was like, why did you hit her with a crowbar? And she told the court that she hit her with a bangle bracelet. And so it, it, it really, I mean, it should have been a red flag at the time. But, I, you know, I kept going into the relationship, and it got worse. You know, she ended up cheating on me over and over again. Um, I mean, I couldn't trust her as far as I can throw her. <laughs> That's how bad this relationship. And the whole point here is, is when we start trying to take things into our own hands, when we start taking things into our own agenda, trying to become, you know, trying to do things on our own without God, we can really make a mess of it. And I encourage all the young men, young uh, women that trust the Lord. You know, I didn't end up getting um, married until 20 years later after I was 18. But a lot of it was kind of my own doing. You know, a lot of it was um, me getting in the way. It's kind of like the children of Israel. A journey that could have, that should have probably took 40 days of travel ended up taking 40 years and a lot of it because of their disobedience. And so, it's one of those things where you want to be able to allow, allow God and invite Him to be able to have a, 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 an aspect of just really sanctifying us, preparing us. Uh, and, and, you know, the thing is, too, there's many things that happen. Uh, you know, we think different from our 18 to our 20s. And we think a lot of times we're different, different from our 20s to our 30s. You know, we, we mature, we, we grow. And, you know, a lot of those things, you know, can be bumps in the road in a marriage. You know, especially if they start going different directions. And uh, so, 
you know, those those aspects of relationship that God can walk you through. So for many years I, I prayed, you know, Lord, is this the year you're going to bring me my wife? <laughs> and I did that for so many years, and it wasn't, it wasn't the year. <laughs> And it happened over and over again. First Corinthians chapter seven verse eight. So I lay. So I say to those who aren't married and to widows, it's better to stay unmarried, just as I am. This is Paul speaking. And it is. And it got to a point where I'm like, well, maybe I have the gift of singleness. You guys ever think about that? Having the gift of singleness, then you can be used for the ministry. Then you can really focus on things. And uh, as a young man. Christian, I had that privilege to be able to do a lot of missions trips, you know, and I was able to do a lot of these things, and I was able to go, and so there are benefits of being single, you know, <clears throat> and so in that process, there would be times when um, I'd, get, I'd meet a girl, and I'd be very excited, and I'd be like, wow, oh, maybe this is the one, and then a few weeks later, something would come up or I'd find something and I'm like, uh, I think, I don't think it's going to work out. And it used to be two months and it got to like two, within two weeks, I already kind of knew <laughs> that it wasn't going to happen. And, you know, <clears throat> but there was always this fear of God in me as well. Especially if there were Christians, as a Christian man, I always thought, you know, that's God's daughter. I don't want to mess with God's daughter. So I had the fear of God knowing, you know what? If our father and so on messed with my daughter, I'd be very angry. You know? And so I always knew not to cross that line. I knew that that was something that I needed to respect in, in the women that I was pursuing. You know, as I realized that I was getting older, <clears throat> God had put it on my heart that, you know, you're not going to be single that much longer anymore. And I, and I was like, why don't, and then I said to God, then God, why don't I live that way? As a single person, I would ask the same question, and, you know, especially if that is your desire, you know you don't have to get the, a singleness and, or what have you, is live like you know, you're not going to be living single that much longer. All the freedoms that you have as a single person, to be able to do the things for God, focus on Jesus. The amazing thing with my wife, I was able to go to Spain on, on to Bible college, and I had already met her, but because I was so focused on the Lord, we didn't really see that. And that was the beautiful thing, is when you least expect it many times, when, you, when you're focused on the Lord, and, and, you know, it's not even, I mean, you're just content and you're in that place uh, is when sometimes the Lord, these things happen when he brings that person to your, to your life. And she brought, you know, he brought me into my life. And I was like, I mean, we, were, we actually ran across each other and didn't even notice, didn't really think, much, you know, anything of it until, you know, later down the line. And so, yeah, chapter 55 Verse 8 says, My thoughts are not like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. And I say this is to release your worldly expectations as well. You know, I have guys that I know that wrote a list of what they want in a wife, and they're all physical attributes. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> and then the only one is like, she has to be a Christian, though. No. You know, and we have to release that as men, you know, as men or young men or people who are seeking to get married is just to let it go, let of go of the worldly expectations and instead have more, you know, godly characteristic expectations and what are you looking for in a, in a spouse. You know, so then we ended up getting married and, and it's great, but you know, and I love being married. And, and it's, there's not one day I wake up where I'm like, oh, man, my wife, I'm so glad I'm married to her. And it's beautiful because God orchestrated it. And if I would have, if we, you know, would have been walking in a place where we were just uh, having these world expectations, we would have totally missed out entirely. 
But I saw that she was beautiful on the outside, but not just on the outside, but she was beautiful on the inside. And I knew that that relationship, because God had put us together, was going to last a long, long time. So in that process, though, there was also and the transition of, of being a, a husband was a new process for me, you know? My family, I had my family, I also had my friends that were like my family, and, but once you become married, things change, you know? Um, your priority is your immediate family, your, your, your wife, and that was hard. I, I had to do it in transitions because I was so used to being single for such a long time. You know, it, it, it took a little while for me to get used to, and, and she was very gracious in that process, you know, in, in being able to walk in that. I love the scripture that was used earlier in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And by testing you, we discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You know, I love what Randy said. You know, there's a battle in the, there's a um, battle of the minds a lot of times that happens with men. Uh, there's past experiences, past triggers. And the reason he designs a, he desires a good relationship from the get-go is so we don't bring all that stuff into our marriage. All those triggers, all you know, all those things that can diminish the marriage. And it's a matter of submitting our thoughts unto God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, it says, We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture the rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. In other words, take our thoughts captive. Taking our thoughts captive and, and, and you know, if we are fulfilling, if we are in the Spirit, it's hard to fulfill the desires of the flesh. And as we continue seeking the Lord, you know, no matter how many times we, we get knocked down, you got to keep getting up and just seek the Lord again. So, I hand it over to, to you. You know, if we look in continuation in Genesis uh, 2, 7, sorry, 15, it says the Lord God placed the man, he placed the first man, Adam, in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. At this point, you know, we're looking at this where, where Eve is not there yet. Um, but what we're seeing here with Adam is he's going about God's business. He's got this full... Uh, focus on just God to the point where he doesn't know that anything's missing. And it's at that point where he's doing God's business that God says in verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. And um, I love that because that was something that hit me in my singleness when I stopped dating and I started pressing into God. I hit a point where I said, you know, I want to be so all about God's business and what he's doing. And I had a friend who told me, um, you know, enjoy this season in your life as a single person because I know you desire marriage and marriage is awesome and great, but you don't get that time back that you have right now, you, you your son and God in ministry and the passions that you have there, your attention will be divided between the demands of the family. And that there's a blessing there too, but it's a reality in terms of what your heart desires in marriage and in the transition as well. So it taught me not to despise the season of singleness, but to actually embrace it and see what else can God do with me in this space of life. Because I did hit a point, right before I met Javier, I was like, maybe I do have the gift of singleness because I'm so happy and content like this. I don't know that anyone else can come in and make this better than it already is because I was feeling so whole and complete in God. And then I thought, well, if God does bring someone, sweet, he's a bonus. <laughs> but no longer that driving necessity. Like, I have to have that to feel complete. It was more like, no, I'm complete. And so I think it's also important to have this distinction when we say the two become one flesh. It's not like you become and take over each other's thoughts and words and everything else and that you mimic each other and become one in that sense, you still have the wholeness as individuals before God. And you bring that together. 
And when you're when you're whole with the Lord and you feel content with Him and Him alone, it allows you to pour out freely in love toward the other person. See, one of the things that we've learned in, in marriage is, um, you know, when we come into conflict with one another, is, and it's one of the first convictions I get from the Holy Spirit. Are you looking at Him to make you feel secure? To make you feel what I can make you feel? Because you were whole before He got there. And I'm like, and it's not to diminish my husband or my love, because I have incredible love and respect for my husband. But it helped me to understand my expectations. Because sometimes what we do is we demand things from people. And in marriage, we go, well, you're my wife, or you're my husband now. And I expect you to bum, 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 bum. And when the expectation is not met, what happens? You get sour. You get resentful. You get moody because they didn't fulfill it. And in these areas where maybe he was busy or he was short with me or I was short with him, God brings this really quick conviction where he's like, you need to come to me and get settled with me. And usually when I do that, there's a call to prayer that happens. It says, do not confront your husband in your anger, in your moodiness, in your discontent, until you have come to me and interceded for him. It's the last thing you want to do in that moment, but the one thing that you should do. And those of you who are single, this goes the same thing for your friendships, your relationships with your parents. If you're in the workplace, the way it is with your coworkers, you've got a conflict, our flesh wants to get in and tell you what you did wrong. But that's not the Spirit of God. When you have conflict, and again, this was my mentor telling me, and I always like to share this for the person who's never heard it. You have a choice when you come into conflict. You can be intercessor or accuser. We know that Jesus is currently interceding for all mankind that no one would perish. That would be his heart. And that they would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Right? So if he has that heart for us, that's us aligning ourselves with God's heart. When we accuse, the word tells us that Satan, or the enemy, the adversary, is the accuser of the brethren. So when we know we get to a place where we want to start accusing people around us, the people that we love, because we're not happy with their behavior, who do you think you're aligning yourself with? So you get this choice because this funny thing happens when you go into intercession. When you pray for the very person that you don't want to pray for, God deals with your heart first. You start to, he starts to reveal why you're so upset. And usually it's not even that person. It's a trigger from somewhere else that that person triggered. And then you have this opportunity to ask God to help to do the very thing you can't do on your own strength and on your own wisdom. And you say, Holy Spirit, help me to be your love and your compassion and to see beyond behavior. Because God will usually point out the stuff that's not so right with you first, and then it humbles you to a place where you go, okay. And when you're in that state, you can actually speak to someone about what's really going on. The fact that what they did, or whatever expectation wasn't met, hurts you. And it comes from a place of hurt, and love, and uh, seeking understanding, not from accusation. Because I'll tell you what happens when you accuse, they can't hear you anyway. The first thing they do is bring up their defense and accuse you back. Or they retreat and build their wall. And they may still be there present, but their hearts already shut you off. And that's where you start to build hardened hearts and relationships begin to fall apart. 